My name is Jared. Um, I work in the data data solutions tribe. Um, my exco is Danella, and I I actually started in Pepco IT as an intern um, in two thousand and eight, um, and I started in the in the MIS team. Uh, I still worked under Studler for those of you who remember him back then, and uh, from then I went to the DevOps team. And uh, from there, I went back into the data team. And now I am a, a solutions architect responsible for the, uh, the data teams, the data solution teams, uh, uh, data analytics uh, uh, platform. So first of all, I would, I would like to point out um, that this picture that was sent out, I, I did fix the dent in my hair, as you can see. Um, in this picture that was sent out, that uh, I was 100% sure that uh, this was a Photoshop issue that uh, Michelle did. But um, she has reassured me that this is how I looked when she took the photo. So I, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that if you look at me now, I don't have a dent in my hair. All right. They call that a serious case of hat hair. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So. Chat GPT and generative AI. Okay, so there's been a lot of hype in the media about buzzwords like generative AI, large language models, Chat GPT. Um, but I think it's important for us to unpack these words and these terms and um, before we move on, just so that we could get some base understanding of what they actually mean. So, first of all, what is Chat GPT? Chat GPT is a large language model that was developed by a company called OpenAI. And it was released in November 2022 as a chat style AI bot that was built on top of OpenAI's GPT-3 family of large language models. It is constantly being fine-tuned with both supervised and reinforced learning techniques. Now, that's a lot of complex words with deep meanings. Um, and I'm sure, there's, I'm sure that made it even more uh, muddy to try and unpack what it is. So let's have a look at what a large language model is. So essentially, a large language model is a probability distribution over a sequence of words. Its main goal is to generate probabilities of the next word in a sequence of words. So in layman's term, you give a large language model a sequence of words, and it will attempt to guess the next word. That's all. That's basically a large language model. For example, my cat caught a so there's a high probability of the next word being a mouse or at night when i'm tired i climb into my there's a high probability of the next word being my bed so that's all that a large language model is attempting to do so let's unpack what does gpt mean so gpt was invented by google in 2017 um, and it stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. So the word generative means a AI that is capable of generating text or images or other media in response to prompts. So it's, interact it's, uh, it's interactive. You can give it input words and it can generate output. So that's what generative means. Pre-trained means a technique that involves training the model on a large amount of data before fine-tuning it for a specific task. So that means we give the model a massive amount of data, but no fine-grained specific task to do, and we train it. Then afterwards, we, we, we fine-tune it, uh, uh, fine it on a specific task it must do. So that's pre-trained. And then transformer. Transformer is a type of deep learning model that requires less training compared to older models. So uh, this just means that it is more optimized and uh, it needs less training data uh, to learn um, than the older models. The older models were called long short-term memory models. So I hope this un clarified at least a little bit of what a large language model is and what GPT stands for. So what, what we did uh, in the data solutions tribe is we tried to come up with how we could 
assess ChatGPT and how we could use it for specific use cases within our team, um, specifically to look at the productivity of our data engineers in our different teams. Um, so we've got a, um, uh, a couple of uh, champions within Pepco IT that are looking at different things. Arnu is looking at RPA. And one of the items that I'm looking at is generative AI and specifically chat GPT. And uh, it's being driven by the different Exco areas within Pepco IT. Right, so just to give some context, um, in the data solutions tribe, we have seven client facing data engineering teams and one internal facing team that's focused on uh, uh, framework development and support. So the assessment that we did when we tested um, and assessed ChatGPT was across all eight of these teams and it was done on a volunteering basis where data engineers uh, across these teams would sign up to, to want to play with ChatGPT and to see if it could make a difference in their lives. Um, luckily for us, we've got uh, quite a young team and they're very enthusiastic. So we had six data engineers across the teams who signed up and they decided they were going to start using ChatGPT. Um, they started using it at the end of November last year, uh, basically when it came out. Um, but we only started providing feedback January this year when we actually um, started comparing uh, its capabilities. So as part of the feedback, uh, we identified the following use cases um, that uh, would make a difference in our uh, data engineers' lives. Uh, the first use case is a programming assistant and code generation, where we look looked into it for assisting with uh, uh, programming in Python, Java, and SQL, um, specifically for boilerplate code and other repetitive tasks. We looked at it from a code reviewing or debugging perspective. Um, a lot of code reviewing is repetitive, for example, to ensure the correct naming standards are being followed or to ensure that code is accurately documented or to ensure that code is not too complex to read or understand, to break the code up into readable uh, segments. Um, we looked at it from a debugging perspective. Sometimes you find a small little bug in your code and that sets you back hours uh, to try and figure out something simple. Um, we looked at it from a documentation uh, and explanation of code perspective. So sometimes uh, document, Documenting and adding comments to your code can be tedious or explaining large blocks of complex code can be tedious, especially when there's a handover process from one developer to another developer and that code was not uh, um, nicely documented or commented and you just receive a block of text or a wall of text. It's quite um, daunting to try and uh, understand that. We looked at it from uh, trying to solve complex problems and soundboarding ideas. Uh, sometimes we are hit with a very complex problem and we don't have anyone to talk to at that moment to try and bounce some ideas with. Um, sometimes uh, if we have to get a bunch of our senior data engineers together, um, it could be quite costly to get all of these um, uh, senior engineers together to soundboard one specific problem and have them all focus on that problem. Uh, we also uh, looked at it from a tutoring perspective for our junior data engineers. Uh, sometimes uh, our juniors require a lot of assistance from our seniors, which takes up time from them in order to, to mentor them. And we looked at it from, lastly, generating test data. So sometimes we have scenarios where we just want to test a concept and generating that test data can be tedious and time consuming. So for our use case, for our assisted programming use case, um, a simple example um, that we had was one of our data engineers needed to write a, a piece of SQL code on BigQuery. And instead of doing it manually, they provided ChatGPT with the context and it generated the SQL query for them. Um, that same data engineer was not proficient in Python yet um, at that stage and asked ChatGPT to write some uh, Python code for them and to explain the code step-by-step step on how the code worked. 
the important thing to note here is that um, it did not just write the code. It also could explain the code block by block to the data engineer and step them through the code so that they could understand the code. Um, we estimated that with these two examples, it saved the data engineer about two hours worth of effort using uh, uh, ChatGPT. For our uh, reviewing and debugging code use case, one of our data engineers was having an issue deploying a cloud function. Um, it was giving a generic error message, which we've all we've all been there, where we get a generic error, mes error message, and then uh, it could be one of ten thousand different things. Uh, the data engineer asked ChatGPT for assistance, provided the block of code to ChatGPT to debug, and within seconds, it was able to uh, identify the uh, the error, and we suspect that this saved uh, the data engineer about two, two to four hours um, time debugging. On our code documentation and explanation of code use case, one of our data engineers needed to make changes to code that was done by another data engineer. The code had no comments or documentation, and it was complex to read. Um, the data engineer was able to provide ChatGPT with the code, ask it uh, to explain the code to them. It was able to do this, and when asked, it could also add comments and document the code for them. We estimate that this saved the data engineer about four hours worth of work um, uh, effort. Um, use case number four is where we looked at uh, complex problems and soundboarding. One of our data engineers was able to ask ChatGPT questions on what is the best, for example, what is the best method in SQL to use to, um, to get the lowest value between two columns. So this is a sort of abstract question. Um, it, it could have easily been done with a Google search, but in this case, they asked ChatGPT, and it could provide them uh, specific uh, examples that was based on their context. The, on the question that they asked. And we estimate that this saved the data engineer a few minutes. Um, and then uh, one of our senior data engineers faced a very complex problem specifically on Paxi, where they were trying to um, rank the top five stores on uh, the amount of parcels sent per store per day per customer. Um, the final solution was a few hundred columns wide uh, where the data engineer had a few back and forth uh, conversations with ChatGPT in order to clarify certain things. And um, they were also able to soundboard the ideas and get specific con contextual feedback from ChatGPT. And we estimate that this saved the senior data engineer about two days worth of effort in order to solve that problem. Uh, when we look at generating test data, one of our data engineers needed to test a concept, but needed test data as the table was not live yet and had no data. Um, he was able to provide ChatGPT with the create uh, table script, and it was able to generate data um, for that table for him. Um, it generated 10 insert statements at a time. He could ask for more. And what's noteworthy here is that it could understand the column data types that were provided in the create table script. So if a certain column was a date, it would provide dates. If it was an, uh, a number, it would provide numbers. If it was a string, it, it would provide string. And where it got certain things wrong, you could reason with it and say, hey, thank you for this, but uh, this column is actually this type. Can you update it? And it would provide you with, a, with the correct uh, insert statement. So, the benefits of using ChatGPT uh, within the data solutions tribe is we could see that it increased productivity. Uh, we could see that uh, the assisted programming uh, use cases that we that we uh, used were, were, were good for our junior developers. And we could see that it was reducing some burden on the senior developers. Um, we could see that some time was saved on uh, researching, debugging, and documenting code, and understanding complex code, reviewing code. Um, it was able to generate test test uh, code or generate test data. And uh, some people were using it in the team 
to reword certain sentences and sent for, for emails that they were sending out, especially if English wasn't their first language. So they all, and they still, I mean, the, the, the data solutions team is still actively using chat GPT to this day to, to help them um, with all of this. We did notice some limitations to the product. Um, we could see that it's very confident in the answers that it gives, even when it gets the answers wrong. Uh, we could see that the product hallucinates artifacts that do not exist. So um, I don't know if everyone's keeping up, but hallucination means it makes up it, it makes up uh, things. It's it's not it effectively lies um, uh, very confidently. And that, that's but but in AI they like to call that halluc hallucination. Um, so. For instance, in, uh, it would uh, if you ask it to generate some code in Java or Python, it might hallucinate classes or packages or libraries that don't exist. We picked that up as well, where it would uh, re reference and import a module that actually doesn't exist. Uh, the product is only capable of interacting with text um, uh, when we were testing it, and it has character limits. So you cannot give it a, a 10,000 lines of code or ask it to write 10,000 lines of code for you. Um, you cannot train it on your own data without incurring costs. So there is a new, fun there is functionality for you to be able to fine tune it on your own data, um, and, but that has a pricing model and we'll need to unpack what the use case for that is. Um, and the product is only, well, when we were testing, it was only trained on public data up to 2021. Um, and it is unaware of anything that occurred after this date. But at that stage, we were aware of third party plugins that were able to overcome that limitation. Um, and our mindset after the feedback that we got was this product should be used as a super powered assistant type of thing. It's not something that would uh, necessarily replace uh, a developer or engineer, but it is something that could be um, used as an assistant to uh, get rid of some um, uh, repetitive uh, work that is that uh, they don't need to, to do. And it needs clear and concise instructions um, because vague instructions produce vague um, outcomes. So what does this mean for the future? So our, we feel that generative AI is still very young, but is growing exponentially. Uh, generative AI capabilities are going to be baked into everything we use. It's going to be baked into Gmail. It's going to be baked into Google Docs, Google Sheets. It's going to be baked into Google Search. We know um, it's already been put into Bing. It's it's going to be part of our lives, um, whether we want <laughs> want it part or not. Um, we know that we will not be able to tell the difference between human generated content and AI generated content. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, generative AI, we know that it'll be better than us at doing certain tasks. Um, it'll be faster than us at doing certain tasks. And if we want to flourish in this AI industrial revolution, we must embrace generative AI and learn to work with it in order to make us more productive or else we will be left behind. So I don't know uh, some of the more tech savvy guys here. Uh, this is a is a graph of Moore's law. I don't know how everyone who knows what Moore's law is. It predicts that every 18 months, uh, the number of transistors um, in a computer chip doubles. Now that's been waning a little bit uh, as of late and it's been moved up to every two years now. Um, but as you can see from 1970 to, 19, uh, to 2020, we've, uh, pretty much consistently been doubling the number of transistors in, in, in our computer chips. We know that there is a physical limit uh, to the number of transistors that you can cram together. Um, I don't know how much of you know that uh, when you buy a processor, it tells you like AMD 
uh, 7 nanometer or, or Intel 5 nanometer, it, it gives you that nanometer um, description. That is the size of the transistor on the chip. Um, once it gets below a certain size, and I think that size is around about 3 nanometers, then it starts getting closer to the quantum level, which means uh, you're going to have more errors in your transistor because uh, in quantum mechanics, if, if uh, uh, an electron is not in a specific state, um, it's not in a fixed state, it can, it can reside in multiple states simultaneously and, and you could have this thing called a quantum jump where an electron can jump from one atom to another atom. Um, and so, so there's going to be a hard limit to the amount of um, transistors that we can have. Um, and as soon as you get to five atoms across, uh, you are exposed to this um, quantum mechanical weirdness. Um, but that doesn't mean that our, our computer power is going to uh, be reduced. Uh, we, we, we're still going to be doubling because we're looking at quantum computers. So um, one of the biggest uh, companies in the world with quantum computers is uh, Google. And uh, we feel that uh, we, where we hit a hard limit with Moore's law, quantum computers will take us further and might be, uh, people suggest it might be infinitely more powerful than, than um, digital computers, but we, we'll have to wait and see. If we look at the computational capacity of the fastest supercomputers in the world, we can see that that is also pretty much doubling every, every few years. And... Um, Currently, in 2022, we were looking at 1 billion gigaflops um, uh, uh, computational power in, in our fastest supercomputers in the world. So a, what, a, what a flop is, is a floating operation per second. And that's the number of um, calculations that can happen um, per second. So a gigaflop, a billion gigaflops is is goes to a to an exaflop, what they call an exaflop, and keep that in mind um, uh, for the for, uh, for the future because um, you'll see in a, in, a, in the next slide. So I was uh, th th this is a, a guy named Ray Kurzweil, and I had the privilege um, together with Daniela last year to go to the Google Next conference in um, Munich. And he was one of the keynote speakers at that conference. And he predicted, he, he's the person who coined the term, the singularity. Um, uh, it's also a, um, a, a word with a, a, a lot of meaning. But he predicted that in 2029, um, AI will, will be able to pass a valid Turing test and achieve human levels of intelligence. And he has predicted this from uh, the, the 90s, uh, uh, and he's stuck to around about 2029. And he also uh, set a date for the singularity uh, being 20, 2045. And he said, well, the, the term singularity means uh, the date that we will be able to um, multiply our effective intelligence by a billion fold in order to merge with, intel with the intelligence that we created. Um, the, yes, so I'm, here, I'm seeing some people saying that Lambda already passed. So he, he mentions a valid Turing test. So some of the AIs have passed Turing tests already, um, but uh, he feels, I'm talking Ray Kurzweil feels that those are not valid Turing tests. Um, and I don't know what his uh, expectation is regarding a valid Turing test. All right, so um, if you remember the one exaflop on the uh, size of our uh, uh, of our computational power of our supercomputers, um, if we look at this graph, this is what neuroscientists have predicted with regards to require um, the amount of computational power and the amount of memory required in order to um, simulate a human brain or a rat brain. Um, so if you look at um, in 2015, 
uh, neuroscientists took a portion of a, uh, a rat brain the size of a grain of sand, and they managed to simulate it with all its neurons. It had, I think it was like 30,000 30, neurons or something uh, in that grain of sand, and, and they managed to simulate that into a computer. And that's basically what we're talking about in this picture over here. If, you, if they took a whole rat brain, um, the number of uh, uh, the computational power required is about uh, 100 uh, petaflops. And they would need just under uh, a petabyte of memory in order to uh, simulate a rat's brain in raw computational power. There's, there's, they still don't have the software. They don't have anything to, in order to do it. But this is raw computational power. And they say that a human brain, they predict that a human brain would need about one exaflop and about a um, hundred or uh, a thousand petabytes or an exabyte of of memory. Now, memory-wise, we 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 can have about an exabyte of memory in the Google data centers, and um, our fastest supercomputer can do about a, uh, an exaflop. So we currently have the raw computational power to almost simulate a human brain. Um, so how smart do we think uh, ChatGPT is? So tell me, uh, ChatGPT 3.5, uh, which is the one that's currently in Bing, what do we think the IQ level of ChatGPT 3.5 is? Type it in the, in the, in the chat. Okay, so some people have got some high numbers there, but ChatGPT 3.5 has got the IQ level of 89. All right, so ChatGPT 4, that's their latest iteration. What do we think the IQ level of ChatGPT 4 is? So ChatGPT 4, which came out, what, a few months after 3.5 has got an IQ level of 155. What do we think the IQ level of Einstein was? What was Einstein's IQ level? Einstein had an IQ level of 160. So currently, ChatGPT4 is comparable to Einstein level IQ. Um, if we if if we look at Einstein and we look at what he managed to accomplish within his life, um, it changed the the whole scientific um, world. It changed everything that we base everything on, um, and it, yeah, it made a disruptive impact on on our world without Einstein. So, how long is it going to take generative AI to surpass? 200 IQ, 300 IQ, um, it's growing exponentially. Um, so OpenAI is using adversarial neural networks on training chat GPT or GPT, their, their neural network, where they use generative AI to train generative AI. So yeah, it's, it's exponential. So what does this mean for the future? So generative AI is a tool that can be used for good and evil. Um, we should make use of it ourselves to be more productive. And we should be wary of others using it for nefarious reasons. Um, it is being embedded into many products already. Um, it is getting better exponentially. Um, they're having quicker iteration times for newer versions. Uh, the more valuable data is provided um, through more people using it. And um, it's getting new versions of itself to teach itself even more. And that's all I have. Any questions? Are there currently any questions for Jared on ChatGPT or in general AI? Christian. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
Bard versus ChatGPT. Why are we not going the Bard route, seeing that we are a Google partner, if I may ask? It's not that we're not going the Bard route. Um, and it's not to say that we won't go the Bard route. Um, it was just that this assessment that we did was specifically for ChatGPT. I know that when uh, we looked at uh, ChatGPT, um, Bard was uh, um, far behind uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT at that point in time. But I do believe that Google will probably uh, surpass uh, OpenAI eventually. So I, uh, yeah, I, there's, I have nothing against Bard. Okay, so Sandy also has a question. I'm um, just wondering what is our company policy with regards access to ChatGPT from our service? I integrated into one of our applications, but I've been waiting three months to get access. Yes, so uh, OpenAI, you sign as part of their terms and conditions, um, your uh, communication with it, they can use for training their model. And we need to have a clear um, privacy policy with um, how we should use um, uh, uh, generative AI um, and s safely within the workspace. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I would say try whenever you use uh, ChatGPT, uh, anonymize um, as much as you can with regards to code, with regards to, to everything that you're using it for before uh, dealing directly uh, with uh, chat GPT. Mm -hmm. All right, and I believe Isel had a question. Isel? I have the same question as Sandy. I also wanted to know, how do we, uh, are there any policies or anything in place for us to use chat GPT? And what about the IP? Especially if we put our code into it, is there no, um, can somebody else not access our IP? Not that the GPT necessary, but we're sort of training them on what we're doing and somebody else can ask them a question and maybe they can get to our work. I don't know. Well, currently, if you look at programming assistant, uh, it has been trained on GitHub. So right? everything on, is already there. In on, on other people's code. You can ask it to do write obscure language, write stuff in obscure languages. And uh, it, uh, OpenAI used Microsoft's GitHub to train it on uh, uh, programming languages. So we need to first understand what do we mean by IP? Um, is it the code that we write? Um, or is it the data that we have? And uh, what, what, what policies do we want to put in PEPCO IT in order to, to, uh, to do that? I, I would assume that uh, data is would, would be private, and we wouldn't want to um, uh, share specific data uh, code. We still need to ask the question: What do we mean by 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 code IP? Okay, so we also have a question from Jan. Hi there. Yes, I'm sorry to to bother. I'm not currently part of Pepcor, although some of you might remember me from my contract today. Uh, Jared, I think this question may have been answered, but just to confirm for, confirm for my own sanity, you only tested 3.5. You didn't do ChatGPT 4. Yes. Uh, we No, we actually tested, yes, it was 3.5 3 and 3. Okay, but so you didn't, so you didn't have an opportunity to try the Wolfram Alpha plugin because that, that, that uh, could be an answer to the hallucination problem you had. Um, yeah, so I currently have a have a subscription with uh, uh, ChatGPT, and I can I'm using four currently. Um, but yeah, the hallucinations. I think I'll I'll have a look at that. That's interesting. I've 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 been using it for um well not coding. I would have loved to know about the coding perspective from that, but maybe I'll bother you again in a few days just to get an answer for that. Thank you. Right, and I believe Marco has a question as well. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. So uh, just something that I've noted is uh, one of the factors holding back AI at the moment, I would say, is uh, ethics. Um, as you mentioned, there can be several applications, uh, both good or bad, uh, 
in terms of uh, Pepco, how do you think we will be able to address such issues? Like uh, uh, there can be, uh, for example, data breaches and stuff. Uh, I've known that chat GPT specifically collects a bit of, uh, can collect some of your information and it's not 100% secure. How, what can we do on our side to uh, have such issue, issues uh, prevented? Well, the answer would be to be diligent. Um, we are we are having data collected from us from Facebook. We are having data collected from us from Google. We are having data collected from us from a whole bunch of companies. Um, and we shouldn't treat uh, ChatGPT any differently. Um, we should know that when we are dealing with it, we are sharing information about ourselves, which is getting used to train um, uh, their model. And it would be the same with BARD. It would be the same with any any generative AI. And uh, if, I mean, there are going to be regulations that are going to be set up uh, by governments about how to address the, uh, certain things with generative AI. But I, I don't think that we can stick our heads in the sand and pretend that they don't exist because of ethics. We are going to have to make use of them and keep up to date with them um, to ensure that people who are using them for nefarious reasons um, uh, won't affect us. So, we, I mean, I can foresee us having generative AI protecting us from generative AI, if, if that makes sense. So our antivirus programs might have generative AI built into them or, or, or spam filters might have generative AI built, built into them because of generative AI being used for really uh, uh, sophisticated scam uh, emails. Uh, so, yeah, it's hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Right. Is there any further questions from anybody? Any questions? Um, Michelle, there's a couple of comments here in the chat. Perhaps you can just run through them. Okay, let's have a look. Um, there's one from Rudy. Can we get some chat GPT for API keys? I hope you're not asking me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it's just a general open question. I, I asked the ops at the uh, Ackermans for the same and in the end I had to pay for mine. No budget, <laughs> no budget. <laughs> um if you if you can't answer that chat i mean it's um... I, I would say if there's a use case that you want to try um speak to your exco and let's try and um set up a, a poc and let's see what we want to use it for right i see sandy has a question um i don't know if it was answered Right, so um, no, great it, for hallucinations. No, sorry, that was just a comment on oh. the hallucinations. <laughs> okay, so I think that is all for the questions that's in the chat that I can see. If anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask Jared now while we're still online, if not, you can still contact Jared after the tech talk session. Jared is more than welcome to answer any questions that you may have. <laughs> And if that is all, thank you everybody so much for your time. Thank you for attending the first Tech Talk from Pepco IT. We will be hosting another one next month. So please watch out for communications. And thank you, Jared, for your insight into chat GPT and your knowledge. Uh, we do appreciate it. And I will be sending out a feedback form to those who attended the session. Please fill in the form and give us your honest feedback. And thanks once again and have a good day further. Bye, everybody.